Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I want to get this conference started. I'm Erin Sandler Rathi. I'm the executive director of the Lexington Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, this is a topic that's really important. And uh, I'm so proud that Secretary Acosta could, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so excited that Secretary Acosta could join us today because she is one of the women at the forefront of this topic. Um, and I wanted to start with her because she's been giving uh, every other week briefings to chambers of commerce and other industry groups, along with Secretary Keneally throughout the pandemic. So that is that is how this topic got onto my radar. And I'm, again, so grateful that she could join us today. Um, since I mentioned the chambers of commerce, all of you, I think, came here through a Chamber of Commerce. Um, we work together around the region. The, the Lexington Chamber is hosting this event, but we work together around the region for economic development and support of the business community. So I wanna give just a, a shout out for a second to my fellow Chamber Directors, some of whom I know are on this call and all of whom have done a great job leading throughout the pandemic. Um, Arlington, Greater Lowell, Malden, Melrose, Medford, Neshoba Valley, Reading North Reading, Stoneham, Wakefield, Waltham, Wilmington Tewksbury, and Winchester. So as you can see, there's a long list of chambers working across this region to make sure that the business community can recover and thrive in partnership, of course, with the Commonwealth. I also wanna thank our sponsors for today um, because we wouldn't be able to put on a conference like this without them. Artists Senior Living in Lexington, In a Nutshell Consulting, the Russian School of Math, and especially Get in Shape for Women of Lexington, um, whose owner is our board chair, Carol DeLugie. Um, so the format for today will be uh, Secretary Costa in a moment is going to give us her keynote address and she is willing to take some questions after that. I encourage you please put questions into the, the Q&A or the chat and I'll be uh, keeping track of those so that when the secretary is finished speaking, we can uh, take some of your questions. After that, we will take a short break, about a five minute break, just so everyone can get up and stretch and shake off a little Zoom fatigue and then reconvene right about 11 o'clock for our panel discussion, which will be moderated by Catherine Carlock of the Boston Business Journal. So I wanna thank everyone for being here. And I'm, I would like to introduce Secretary Rosalind Acosta. She is the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In her role, she manages the Commonwealth's workforce development and labor departments to ensure that workers, employees, and the unemployed have the tools, training, and safety resources needed to succeed in the Massachusetts economy. Secretary Acosta also chairs the Workforce Skills Cabinet alongside the Secretary of Education and the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development. Prior to joining the baker Polito administration, she was a widely respected financial and banking service professional with over 30 years of experience in Greater Boston Financial Institutions. Secretary Acosta was a director and planning committee member of the Merrimack Valley Workforce Investment Board and was appointed a Northern Essex County community, excuse me, Northern Essex Community College trustee by Governor Baker. She's been named one of Boston's most influential women by the Women of Harvard Club and El Planeta's top 100 most influential Hispanics in Massachusetts. She has also been awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association for Latino Professionals for America. Born in Cuba, she earned a Bachelor of Arts from Wesleyan University in Connecticut, where she was a member of the women's varsity ice hockey team. She is the proud mother of five children. And I know that this is a subject very dear to her heart. Um, so Secretary Acosta, thank you very much for being here. And I would like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Erin, very much. And, and of all that uh, long description of my biography, I think that uh, the ice hockey one is probably the one that folks are usually remember the most. So I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Um, again, virtually, uh, who would have known, right, one year ago, actually 
14, almost 14 months ago that we would still be doing this. I think when we started this in uh, last March, we all thought, wow, you know, this will only be another few weeks. This is, this is not going to last very long. And, and one year ago, we were already into this uh, uh, almost a month and a half. So, uh, but I think very soon, very soon, Aaron will be having these, uh, having these in person. So thank you so much uh, for inviting me today um, in this uh, hopefully interactive discussion. Uh, it couldn't be a more important time for us to be uh, working together to make sure that we come out of this, uh, this pandemic uh, in a very uh, equitable uh, and inclusionary way. Uh, this has obviously been a, a pretty devastating, devastating year. Uh, you know, and we, if you, if you pan back the camera, this has been a, a global event that has affected every country, has affected our country, has affected every county within our state, and has affected us uh, personally uh, uh, with family members uh, and, uh, and, our, and our friends. So as we now look to the future and, and what we can do, I just wanna share with you just a little bit of a journey of kind of where, where we've been, uh, certainly uh, from the lens of one of my agencies, uh, which is the, the Department of uh, Unemployment Assistance, uh, that I know you've all read about uh, and that you've all had uh, some uh, experience with. Um, but, you know, prior to the pandemic, we had never seen a single week uh, with more than 30,000 people claiming unemployment insurance. And during the pandemic, we saw 10 consecutive weeks uh, with greater than 30,000 claims. In a typical year, so for example, in 2019, we paid out $1.4 billion in unemployment claims. In 2020, in all of 2020, we paid over $22 billion in unemployment claims uh, between the traditional unemployment dollars uh, and the new uh, dollars uh, for programs that would never existed before in the Commonwealth, like the pandemic, unemployment assistance for independent uh, workers uh, or gig workers. You know, we went from an unemployment rate of one of the best in the country at 2.8%. Uh, back in March of 2020 to one of the worst unemployment rates in the country at 17.7% uh, last June. The economic fallout has hit women especially hard. The labor force participation rate for women in mass is around 60% as opposed to around 70% for men. And when I look at the unemployment claims we currently have, women make up 54% uh, of that claimant pool of folks um, still on unemployment over an extended period of time. And the pandemic driven recession has hit female dominated job industries more than men. That is particularly true for industries like healthcare, which during the great recession were not affected at all, but during this recession lost hundreds of thousands of jobs. The Bureau of Labor Statistics recently did a study in mass that showed during September and October of last year, when asked the question, did the coronavirus prevent you from working, from looking for work in the last four uh, weeks? <clears throat> Around 70% of women said yes, whereas only 30% of men said yes. And in addition to women, this recession, like the last one, has also had an outsized effect on communities of color in Massachusetts. The unemployment rate for Latinos in Massachusetts is over 17.5%. For Blacks, it's over 14.5%, and for Whites, it is around 9%. And while our unemployment uh, rate has dropped, uh, we are uh, at 6.8% right now for the month of March, uh, that, um, that rate is still high uh, among our communities of color. The predominant reason for these discrepancies is the fact that low-wage work sectors in retail and food and accommodation, as well as healthcare, have been hardest hit. Uh, these are the areas that index much higher um, to Latinos and Blacks, whereas higher wage sectors like finance and insurance, manufacturing, construction skew much more male and white, and they've been less affected by this recession. Again, a difference uh, from the 2008 recession, uh, where uh, we've seen a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the sectors, um, there's been a shift in the sectors that have been uh, disproportionately impacted. Even more troublesome is a lot of the post, um, the pre-pandemic future of work research. They had estimated that about 70% of retail and food service jobs would be fully automated by a midpoint scenario of 2030. If that, if the pandemic will accelerate those trends is still unknown. And as you know, as we've seen now with, um, with Zoom and, and WebEx, whatever your choices of a virtual meeting, uh, 
it's working very effectively in some sectors of our economy uh, and our business travel is down. So we, we don't know how much of that is going to come back or how long it's gonna take for it to come back. But some predictions um, do estimate that it will be years before some of that, for, for example, business travel uh, gets back to, um, to pre-pandemic level, levels. So that's where we are now, uh, a pandemic driven recession whose epicenter really has been around women and particularly women of color. Um, Massachusetts has lost 700 jobs um, at the height of the pandemic and about 375,000 were gained back, but we still have about 325,000 to go before uh, we can say we've appro approached a full employment, a full employment um, economy again. There are going to be some challenges of getting there, uh, but there are also some opportunities. And the pandemic has really highlighted the inequalities in the workforce. They've always been there, but they have been uh, completely underscored. And as we look towards reemployment with the collective mission of fixing those inequalities, I believe there's an opportunity to, to transition to more uh, women and people of color into more resilient and higher paid jobs. So we can, uh, I, I'm very interested in taking uh, your questions, um, but there are a lot of businesses that are working <clears throat> on this. And frankly, I'm more um, encouraged than ever. I started uh, in the workforce uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and uh, so many of the issues that we uh, were dealing with as women have improved. Um, my fear is that you know this pandemic will uh, bring us back and to uh, it, you know regress uh, it, and take away some of the progress that we have gained. Um, but I but I balance that that uh, that nervousness with some optimism um, and the fact that I see uh, businesses really coming to a greater level of, of understanding, reckoning, if you want to call it, um, that women are very, a very important part of their workforce. And childcare is a very important uh, piece of the conversation here. Uh, access to affordable and high quality childcare should not be like the Hunger Games for women. It should not be something that we're out looking for on our own. We should have a collective um, a, approach to helping women have access to affordable uh, and high quality child care. Uh, women dropped out of the workforce uh, this year in unprecedented numbers. Uh, the fact that kids were uh, working, um, kids were, were in school uh, at home. Um, you can't leave a five-year-old on Zoom and say, good luck, you have to be there. So um, frankly, many women found that too difficult to do and have dropped out. So we need to get these women back into the workforce at the same levels, not lower levels, but at the same levels um, that they were when they left. And uh, in order to drive a more inclusive economic recovery, we're going to have to think about how we uh, collectively, and that means business, that means government, um, our education partners, how are we going to help uh, promote policies? Um, that help with flexible, more flexible hours for women, um, issues of affordability and childcare. Uh, how are we as a workforce and an employer group uh, going to uh, look at intentionally hiring back these women, retraining them into careers with mid-wage pathways, uh, career pathways? Um, and like I said, I, I am more optimistic than ever that there's a more universal recognition uh, about the importance of gender, racial, and ethnic diversity among a broader spectrum um, of businesses. Uh, not only do we uh, need to help women get back to work, but we need to help, we need to provide the uh, proper supports to help them retain that work through work, uh, work support systems. Um, and that again also includes uh, not only childcare, but help with uh, transportation barriers if there are any. And if the transportation means getting online, uh, then how do we help with um, access to the internet, access to digital literacy programs, et cetera. There are a lot of good examples, I think, around the Commonwealth um, uh, that both uh, we're doing uh, here um, in the Executive Office of Labor Workforce Development through our Mass Higher Career Centers. Uh, and there are a lot of businesses uh, uh, that are also looking at these, um, at all of these issues and, and really working hard um, uh, to make sure that we're collaborating in this effort to get women back to work, um, again, in a more equitable and inclusionary way. So uh, with that, Erin, I would, I would rather stop here and, uh, and take questions from, uh, from, your, from your audience um, than 
having them continue to listen to me. <laughs> I think we're enjoying listening to you, but um, but thank you. Yes. Um, so please start putting questions out there for the secretary, and I'll I'll be happy to ask them. I have a couple of questions just as you were speaking. Things that I was thinking about. Um, you know, as chambers of commerce, we represent businesses and we and the employer side of things a lot. Um, and I'd like to think that employers, as you said, we're, we're more enlightened than say in the 80s, we understand why women are vital to the workforce. Uh, but there's still always, there's going to be the question of cost for employers, right? To bring people back, they, they laid people off because they had no choice. And so I think there's, there's kind of a chicken and egg there of, you know, the business has to be doing better so they can hire people back how do we overcome that issue? So, you know, it, it's interesting, Erin, and they're coming from the, from the private sector. And as you said, you know, 30 plus years in the private sector, and this is my first public sector job. And, um, you know, one of the things that has stood out to me very, very clearly in the almost four years I've been here is that, you know, we can't do any of this um, as one sector by ourselves. Um, it's got to be a multi-prong uh, effort. And you know, there's more money coming to the states now than ever before. So it shouldn't be a money problem. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a federal budget right now, like one we've, I've never seen, certainly in my, in my career. Um, and the problem I don't think is gonna be money. I think it's gonna be more coordination. And, uh, you know, the, there's only so much capacity and infrastructure that money can, um, can buy you, right? You, you need to have coordinated um, programs on the ground to make sure that as this money is funneled into the system, it's funneled in the most effective way. And that's, you know, always the scariest part about, um, you know, when you're when you win the lottery, right? And think about how many people, when they win the lottery, right, blow that money because there's no effective um, plan for that money. Um, so maybe a little akin to winning the lottery for states. You know, if the states don't take a very, very um, deliberate approach um, to making sure that this money is equitably distributed, and, I, and I'll give you one example. You know, one area one, um, that is very dear um, to my heart and very passionate about. Um, is ESOL uh, and English as a second language. You know, as I look at the claimant pool that we have, and I see that 20% of our unemployment um, claimants are Latinos. Not all 20%, right, need, are gonna need ESOL, obviously, uh, but a percentage of those will. And when I look at the sectors that have been hit the hardest of retail, leisure, um, and accommodations, those tend to be uh, skewed to more low wage workers, uh, they, are, they, are, they tend to be um, skewed to more Latino and black workers. Uh, but the ESOL is, is um, something that we're gonna have to, as a, as a um, state, uh, make sure that we are being very intentional about how those dollars are distributed within our workforce system and that the ESOL is integrated with training, with workforce training. Um, because ESOL, um, you know, some folks just need English um, without the, the, the workforce training. But in, in, for example, in our workforce competitive training fund, this is what we do. We, we always pair up um, training needs with other work support systems. And, uh, and in many cases, it's adult basic education and English as a second language. That is vital to making sure that that worker not only gets the job, but stays in the job. Um, and again, that's something that as we start thinking about how do we allocate some of the money that we're about to receive. And by the way, we still have to hear from the federal government if we're gonna be allowed to use the money for workforce. We have plans, we have lots of plans, um, but I have to make sure that, that the dollars that I wanna use for workforce, I will be allowed to use uh, for, for workforce. So we're still waiting on, on that. Um, but I, I know that uh, that this is something that's going to take a, take a village, if I can use the over overused phrase, uh, to make sure that we're uh, that we're executing properly. That's actually we have a question from uh, one of the attendees, in fact, about the infrastructure plan and the fact that the uh, you know the federal government has recognized thirty nine dollars thirty nine billion dollars 
is allocated toward childcare. That's an unnecessary infrastructure improvement. Um, so the question is, um, what do you think of the realistic possibility that that plan will pass? Mm -hmm. And if it does, what does that mean for Massachusetts? You know, my my crystal balls haven't been all that great lately, so I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start predicting. Look, I think there's a there is absolutely recognition, you know, countrywide um, that this is this is more important. Um, There's a very important workforce issue uh, is, is the childcare issue. Um, I'm optimistic that that it will pass. Um, you know, I'm working closely with our commissioner of um, early education, Commissioner Sam, as we call her, um, to make sure that we're integrated. Whatever work uh, policies uh, come out of EEC also are integrated with our workforce initiatives. And um, so working uh, closely with her uh, in, in, in the capacity of our workforce skills cabinet uh, to make sure that we're lockstep in that. And we are, I mean, if you know anything about Governor Baker's cabinet, we're, we're a very close cabinet. Um, and, uh, and secretaries work extremely uh, well together. And as I tell them all the time, Everything is about workforce. Every single every single cabinet position we have uh, ultimately pivots back to uh, to workforce. So uh, so we work very closely together to make sure that we're integrating our policies and and EEC is is among one of our highest priorities right now. I will say it, it's very clear from those briefings that I referenced that the all of the departments work very well together, and I think that's been an advantage for the Commonwealth in this pandemic because I know not every state has that level of coordination, especially at your level of the all the different programs that are happening at once. So I, I appreciate that. And I wanna thank you on behalf of everybody here for that kind of cooperation and coordination. Um, one question someone asked, what's the percentage of women who dropped out of the workforce in 2020? Uh, I don't have a percentage uh, right in front of me, Erin, um, but we know that right now, um, 54% of them are claiming unemployment uh, insurance. Um, and only 60% of our labor force right now is, uh, uh, is women. So there, there has definitely been a, a drop, um, a double digit drop. I just don't know the exact number. Sure. No, it's obviously it's very significant. Um, and that's, that's why we're all here today. Um, one of the questions that we hear from employers, and, and um, this question has come up with a, a attendee as well, the extra um, unemployment benefits, there's a perception that that's uh, lessening the motivation for people to go out and find jobs. So employers are having trouble finding workers. They, re they report that they're having trouble finding workers because those workers would rather stay on unemployment. So how do we navigate that relationship between wanting to support people who definitely need the help still at this point in the pandemic, but also encouraging them to you know, go out and seek work because the employers are hiring again? Yeah, so it's a really good question. So I'll tell you that um, all of these uh, federal unemployment benefits right now, unless they're extended, <clears throat> expire on September 6th. Um, we know that 60% of our claimant pool right now is receiving more. I'll say that again, 60% of our claimant pool right now is receiving more on unemployment than they would if they went back to their, uh, to their old jobs. So <clears throat> that tells us that um, we have a pretty strong love affair in Massachusetts uh, with low wage work uh, and also has really put a spotlight on, um, uh, you know, on, on, potentially the quality of work um, that we also have in Massachusetts. And there's nothing wrong with entry level positions as long as there's some career path out of that or, or up from there. Um, but we are um, you know, reaching out to all our unemployment claimant, um, claimants to make sure that they're aware of training. So some are using this time to get trained, um, uh, to look for either ESOL training or to look for adult basic education training, Look for training in um, in other uh, in other uh, fields like farm tech, um, medical devices, etc. So, so we are um, encouraging people to use this time uh, to upskill. So, because September, though it seems far away, it, it's really not. And you know, by July and August, I know that we'll start seeing a little bit of a panic. Um, you know, in our mass hire systems. Uh, from folks coming in and and trying to now find work there are 
a lot of open positions. And, and what, what's really fascinating to me is that, you know, when we were at 2.8% unemployment, I heard from employers, we need skilled workers. Now we're at 6.8% un, uh, unemployment. And I still, I still hear the same thing. We really need skilled workers. Uh, so, so that need is, is there. Uh, the programs and the budget items, uh, for example, the Career Techn Technical Initiative and the governor's budget, really are um, are meant to hopefully encourage people to get back into the workforce. Um, these programs are at no cost to workers, um, will uh, uh, provide training and, and skills training into really good middle wage jobs in the trades. Um, uh, we have apprenticeship programs for, um, for I IT. Uh, we have um, an alliance uh, with uh, Apprenti. And Apprenti um, is providing training for um, cybersecurity analysts, um, web developers, software developers. Uh, <clears throat> and the majority of the people that, for example, go into the, these apprenticeship programs are either not working or making minimum wage, $25,000, $30,000 a year. By the time they're done with this program, which is six months of classroom and six months of, um, of, in, of, of uh, on the job training, they, they graduate um, into these jobs making $75,000, $80,000 a year. That's a transformative change in someone's life. So, uh, so I, I also um, am pushing our apprenticeship programs quite hard. Um, I think apprenticeship programs provide opportunity uh, for people that want to uh, move up, um, not, not only if they're looking for a job, but if they're in a job. So we're working with um, employers uh, and I encourage anyone here that's interested in talking to us about apprenticeship programs um, because it's not just about the trades uh, in apprenticeship, it's also uh, we've diversified um, our apprenticeship programs into healthcare, manufacturing, um, IT, uh, finance, banking. Uh, we have a new apprenticeship programs in banking uh, that we'd love to talk to um, you know, any of our employer communities about. So. Uh, so I think there's a lot of programs that we can um, that that are out there to connect people back into the workforce. The willingness piece is hard, Erin. Right? <laughs> make people do this. Um, we're going to put as many carrots out there as we possibly can because at the end of the day, unemployment doesn't come with health care insurance and dental insurance and retirement um, benefits. Um, the summer is coming and the beach is calling. And if you cannot work, I guess that's an, an, an incentive, but we're hoping that people are really gonna get really serious about this um, this summer uh, to try to get back to work. That's excellent, thank you. Um, the representative from Lexington, Michelle Sicklo, is on um, and actually has her hand up. So I'm gonna let her um, speak because I'm guessing she has something she would like to add to this. Um, so Michelle, hi, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Erin, and um, thank you, Secretary Acosta, for being here at our chamber. I'm really grateful to you for spending so much time with us this morning. I just wanted to comment and perhaps ask a question. Um, one of the things I'm hearing a lot from constituents who specifically are in the child care industry, who own um, child care operations within my district, is that the mismatch between the, um, the low-wage workers and what's being paid, for instance, in the public school systems is a real impedi impediment for them to be able to get workers. And so because we know that the child care issue underpins our entire economy and all women be being able to go back to work, or most women being able to go back to work, I wanted to hear your thoughts on how we can address that mismatch um, and, and whether or not there's any opportunities to look to some of our seniors perhaps who are um, close to retirement age for transitioning them into the field. Perhaps they, they would be workers that might be interested in childcare work. Um, and any other, you know, any other thoughts you have, whether it's tax incentives for the parents or some other programs specifically for the childcare operators. Here up, Sicolo, how are you? Um, can, I, can, I, can I say all of the above? Um, I, I think, uh, Aaron, you probably should invite um, Commissioner Sam. I think that would be a great, uh, she would be a great uh, guest because I think this is a really, really important topic. Uh, you guys may have missed uh, the part when Aaron said that I had five children. So, uh, <laughs> so they are all, uh, they're all adult kids now, adults now. Um, and, um, but I'll, I'll tell you in the, um, in the 90s and the 2000s, raising, raising five kids, um, was not easy. Um, and I became a single mom when my youngest were five. So um, 
accessibility and affordability of child care um, has been a woman's problem forever, uh, since women started uh, working um, in the workforce, right? 100 years ago plus. Um, it's only now that I am hearing these kind of conversations and to hear a rep Ciccolo say, you know, what should we do from a government perspective? I mean, it's music to my ears. Um, when I hear businesses um, talk about, you know, we need to get together as a business because it's not a woman's problem. It is now a business problem. Uh, and it's always been a business problem, uh, except we women have very, very broad, strong shoulders. And we have been uh, carrying this enormous weight all by ourselves. Um, so I think the, um, the solution to this is not, you know, is that it's not one answer, it's multifaceted. I think it is a combination um, potentially of tax credits. I think it's a combination of potential employer incentives, more government incentives. Um, we just have to be careful, right, with budgetary line items because they don't always survive. And I'd love to, love to see uh, love to see a situation where it's more permanent, you know, permanent infrastructure fix versus um, versus something that's dependent year um, year upon year on, on on the budget. So so I think it really is something that has to be um, government um, and employer based, not just uh, you know not just one or the other. Um, but I I have not heard employers talk about early child care ever in my career as much as I am now. Um, the Mass Business um, Coalition um, on Skills, uh, some of you may have heard of, and I encourage you, uh, you know, so many chambers on here, um, that um, uh, you know, think about this uh, partnership uh, that's Jim Rooney from the Greater Boston Chamber is, um, is I believe, hosting this uh, group. Uh, there are about six chambers already uh, already participating in this. And the whole idea here is to, um, is to advocate for equitable workforce policies. So as we emerge from this pandemic, we're emerging with full consciousness um, that diversity and inclusion have got to be front and center of any conversation uh, for any kind of um, workforce policy uh, that emerges not for, just from government, but from a much more coordinated business perspective. Um, you know, we've been talking about this stuff for many, many uh, years, a long time. Um, but again, I have never seen the appetite um, as, I, as I see it now. And, you know, a crisis would be a, a terrible thing to waste. Um, <laughs> and I think we are, we are in a position right now where we've got, women have everyone's attention. Um, and we really need to make sure that we are taking advantage of this moment um, and that we're not letting go of this moment uh, to make sure that we are finally getting what we need as women in the workforce, which is, you know, if you have children, that's a pretty darn important part of your success. Um, and to make sure that you make it through the day uh, without having to worry about, you know, picking up your kids at 3 p.m., uh, which is impossible when you're a full-time working woman. Rep Sicolo, thank you again for, for being here and thank you for your support of the Lexington community and representing all of our interests so well. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Rep Sicolo. Good seeing you. Good Good to see you. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Um, we have, you know, we have another question actually about some of the, the women that don't fall into neat categories. Um, so women who have, say, micro businesses or they're working out of their home, freelancers, solopreneurs, they often have difficulty accessing both capital and medical benefits. So in terms of reviving their business, how can how can your office address some of the issues that that those really you know one or two person businesses face? So yeah, that's uh, that's obviously something that um, uh, that we have to look at as we as we start looking at um, the this recovery and micro businesses. Um, you know, technically, uh, usually uh, historically have the least amount of resources. Uh, through Secretary Keneally's office, uh, millions and millions of dollars uh, have gone out uh, in the form of grants uh, to uh, two very small businesses. And, and I hope that whoever's asking that um, knows about some of those grants. Um, we also, um, you know, I think as a micro business, a small business, 
Uh, you also have the opportunity of partnering with other large businesses, for example, uh, in, in training for employees. If you are, if you are looking to take on one person, uh, can you uh, can you join with an employer group? Can you apply for a workforce training fund grant, for example, um, uh, one of our, our, our express grants uh, where um, the trainee would be among, um, would be training among other um, job seekers or other candidates in other jobs, um, but you take advantage of that, um, you take advantage of that training um, that's going on for your worker. So I think there's, gonna, there's, a, there's a lot of places to, um, to join with other groups. Um, and I encourage you also to look at our Comcore website uh, where we also have a lot of training grants out there. Um, but the, but the, um, through the uh, housing and economic development, I would encourage you to look at some of the grants available uh, through, that, uh, through that secretariat. The, the health insurance question is really a big one, um, because I know uh, I deal with this in my chamber, I'm sure the other directors do as well, and, and one of the attendees just asked uh, this question, I mean, you know, as a micro business, you don't have access to large group plans, so often you're going through Health Connector, which is an invaluable resource, and, you, you know, should the Affordable Care Act end up going away, then, you know, we've got this huge, huge mess that we'd have to solve so at least we have that but it's it's sometimes just totally unaffordable but there's this person is quoting in the the chat that it, it's thirty thousand dollars in health care to cover herself and her spot her spouse um so that becomes a huge impediment to a micro business surviving yes it is and uh, i don't have any any great answers uh for for the health care uh, for the healthcare side, um, I think that that's that's a you know one of the major expenses right in, in, in any in any business is, is that you know your people and if you don't have people it's your it's your healthcare um, uh, and I think that's one place that there's still lots of work to do. So before we wrap up, I want to ask this is a great question. Someone asked, "What is the most hopeful opportunity you see in the next six months? What do you see coming for women in the workforce?" You know, I, again, I, it's a great, it's a really great question. Um, I, I'm hopeful, as I've said, I think a few times today, um, I'm hopeful that there's a, a greater recognition of the importance of women in the workforce uh, and the kind of supports that we need. And it doesn't make us lesser. It doesn't make us, you know, a more uh, um, risky employee. It makes us you know, very valuable, uh, very valuable piece of the workforce um, that happens to be juggling a lot of different, that happen to be juggling a lot of different things. And we do that really, really well. I am hopeful that there is that recognition. I've never seen that kind and level of recognition and the willingness to work. The conversations are different. Um, the conversations are very different now than certainly I've been having um, as a worker um, over the last, you know, couple of decades of, of my career, uh, where the shame and the, you know, and the, the embarrassment of being pregnant uh, was so, uh, was so prevalent. And, and I mean, I remember that clearly, and I got pregnant a few times, um, you know, having that, that conversation with my employer and being scared to death, being absolutely scared to death, uh, to tell my boss, usually my white male boss, um, that I was pregnant, because what if, you know, he thought then that I really wasn't as committed to being here, that I wasn't committed to, to my work, which I really was. And since I was a single mom raising five kids, I was pretty committed to work. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I, 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 th I don't I think we've we've gotten through that um, a bit. Um, there's still there's still that. I'm not saying it's been eliminated, but it's certainly not cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly not not something that that anyone would readily admit, um, and people are certainly not being as blatant about that. But um, but I do believe that employers understand the importance of women in the workforce, and we all know that you know diversity in the boardroom, whether it's gender, racial, ethnic diversity, creates more profitable institutions. It is not an anecdote; it is fact, uh, and we've known it all along. Uh, but now I think the folks in power know it. Uh, and I am optimistic that we, you know, we're smart here in Massachusetts. We are smart. We are, we are the leaders in so many things around the, around the world. We, we are first in so much, first in pu public libraries, first in universities. 
We also were the first to make the chocolate chip cookie, by the way. Um, <laughs> so we, had, we had a lot of firsts. Why can't we be the leaders in this issue? And that's what I'm striving for. I'm striving for Massachusetts to be the leader in women's issues, uh, in, in gender issues, uh, I'm sorry, in gender, racial, and ethnic issues um, in the world. I think we can do it. And I think we've got, a, for the first time, a coalition of businesses uh, that, is, that wants to work with, with us in government, um, that want to work with nonprofit organizations and education institutions um, and make this happen. So I am bullishly, I am always pretty obnoxiously optimistic, but I, I, think, uh, I think I'm warranted to be optimistic this time. That's excellent. And I, I appreciate your commitment to all of this. I, I think that everyone here has confidence that if anybody can make Massachusetts the first in those issues, it would be you. I'm, we're very glad to have you leading that charge. We're, we're very lucky to have you in that. Um, one last question before I let you go. Are there any other resources or organizations that people can be looking at outside of your office? Um, you do you have wonderful programs, and I know um, programs like Mass Hire are uh, underutilized, and, and you're always telling us that we need to remind people to use them. Um, but other, other resources and organizations doing some of this kind of work, any that you'd like to mention? I was actually going to talk about Mass High. <laughs> Please, no, go ahead. Really. Well, no, and I, so I will, I will do both. But um, I, I, I want folks to really, really um, work with our Mass Higher uh, Career Centers. Uh, that is your gateway to workforce uh, training resources or any kind of workforce resources. Uh, we can talk to you about grants. We can talk to you about uh, training programs. We can connect you to childcare. So, uh, so we are working very closely to, with EEC, connecting um, uh, folks to childcare if they need childcare. So, we are really kind of become becoming a one-stop shop pretty pretty quickly. Um, you know, we have um, great resources, and, and we want to make sure that both job seekers and employers are using us. We've done everything virtually since last March. We have been connecting people through virtual career centers. We've held, held several uh, career centers virtually, uh, career fairs, I'm sorry, uh, virtually since last year. We've connected hundreds of employees to employers uh, that are seeking work. Uh, so please take advantage of, of that resource. At some point, we'll, we'll open back up to walk in once uh, you know the, we're, we're more vaccinated and, and we're all more comfortable with walk-in. Uh, we some some of our centers are having walk-in by appointment only. Most of them are still are still virtual. Uh, and then I would encourage um, uh, the chambers to really look at look into this business uh, mass business coalition. Jim's going to kill me. His phone's going to be ringing off the hook. Um, but uh, but I think connecting to Jim Rooney over at the Greater Boston Chamber um, to ask about you know what is this group trying to accomplish? How can you bring that message uh, and cascade that down to your membership and your chambers? Um, again, if we all do this in every region of Massachusetts, um, I think we have a real shot at getting this right. Uh, I think we have a real shot at using the dollars that are hopefully coming our way um, from the federal government in the most effective um, and equitable way possible. That is certainly my goal um, as your secretary, um, as a Latina woman. Um, I am uh, very, um, uh, very laser focused in making sure that we're distributing these dollars in the most equitable and inclusionary way as we possibly can as we get mass back on its feet. Um, and I implore you to help me do that. What, what do you think it is about mass hire that makes it difficult, that, that keeps it underutilized? Is it that people don't know about it? Do people have the wrong perception of the programs? Um, what, what do you think it is? I think it's just lack of perception. I mean, uh, government does a lousy job marketing. I mean, we don't, we, I mean, we don't use public funds to market anything. So um, we did rebrand our mass hire centers uh, a couple of years ago, and that's helped us with our traffic tremendously. Then we, of course, hit, got hit by the pandemic. Um, but um, before we rebranded to mass hire, uh, you know, we have 29 career centers. Uh, we have. Um, um, regional workforce investment boards. We had 49 different names. Uh, so you can't brand yourself if you have 49 different names. So 
so a couple of years ago, we, we rebranded to Mass Hire. I think that's helped a lot because now we can speak as one voice, one public workforce system instead of individual parts. I can do more from a state perspective in lifting the name um, because I'm not getting Cape Cod mad because I'm talking about Berkshire. I'm not getting Franklin County mad because I'm talking about Boston. Now I can just talk about the, the Mass Hire workforce system. Uh, and I think the employer engagement piece for me has been the most challenging one. If, you know, if I look at, again, at a particular program, our apprenticeship programs, uh, I look at Apprenti, you know, I hear employers tell me all the time that they really need IT folks that they, in, in all kinds of occupations within IT, uh, particularly cybersecurity is such a big deal right now for all of us. Um, and I have a program for you. Uh, I just need employers because I won't put anyone through that program unless it's an employer at the other end, because we right. don't want to do training just for training sake. Uh, there are many programs out there that charge people, you know, $15,000 to go through a training session and then they get out and they're still looking for work and now they have debt. I don't want to do that to people. Um, so we want to make sure that we provide training, uh, low cost or no cost, uh, and uh, and that they have a job at the end of that uh, at the end of that path. Well, thank you for that, and thank you again for being here. Thank you for everything that you've been doing. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your example to uh, the rest of us women, to Latinas around the state, to financial professionals looking to aspire. I mean, at all of it really. Um, and I'm sure uh, your children look at you with great pride um, for That's everything you've enough. accomplished. <laughs> they, they do, they, they don't want to admit it necessarily, but I'm <laughs> sure that they're extremely proud of you. I've, so. I'm very fortunate, Erin. I've got, got a bunch of great kids and, um, and you know, we, we, you know, this is, this is a, um, obviously a topic I'm very energized about. And, uh, and I think uh, there's nothing that women can't do when we put our heads together. So, uh, so let's, let's, let's get at it. Yeah, thank you. We're getting a lot of comments about you being an inspiration uh, and 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 the support of women by women is really important. I mean, that's what today's conference is all about too. So, um, again, thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. We're going to take a short break for about five minutes, and um, when we come back, we'll have our panel discussion. So. I'm gonna turn off my camera and, and mute for five minutes and we'll come back at about 10.55, let's say, um, to have the panel discussion. Thank you everyone, appreciate being here today. Thank you so much.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, I am so pleased. Thank you very much for all your participation in the conversation with Secretary Acosta. Um, and I have seen from your comments and so forth that I agree, it was a wonderful conversation. We're gonna keep the conversation going with this fabulous lineup of women. Um, all of these women that you're about to meet are leaders in you know, journalism, industry, nonprofits across the state. So um, I'm gonna turn it over first to Catherine Carlock. She's the real estate editor for the Boston Business Journal and has also been writing about women's issues. And Catherine, I, it's now your turn to moderate and, and introduce everyone else. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Erin. And I wanted to say thank you to Secretary Acosta as well. I think that there, there was so much information jam-packed into that into that keynote. And Erin, so thank you for, uh, for bringing her in this morning. Uh, so as Erin said, I am Catherine Carlock. I'm the real estate editor at the Boston Business Journal. I, I also have been covering women in business for the past several years and am so excited to be here with you all this morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our illustrious esteemed panelists uh, for, for sharing your expertise here today. So uh, I would like if, if all of you can maybe go down the line and just say a little bit about who you are, where you work, and your interest in sort of women in the workforce, and then we can get right to it. Katie, why don't we start with you? Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Johnston. I write about work and income inequality um, for the Boston Globe. I also edit the annual Top Places to Work magazine. And as I write about work, I write a lot about women being one myself <laughs> and working moms also being one myself. So it's an area that I'm greatly interested in. Thanks for having me. Sarah, what about you? Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. I am Sarah Hamilton. I'm the Senior Director of Human Experience at Work Human. Um, my job is literally to make work human. Uh, we're fortunate enough to be helping to build cultures of some of the best brands in the world, honestly, and doing that through the power of human connection. And it starts with our very own humans. Um, so, so I'm just thrilled to be here um, as a working mom myself, as Katie, as Katie mentioned, um, you know, this is something that obviously affects me personally, um, as well as all of the humans that, that I work to represent every day. So pleasure to be here. All right, we'll keep going down the line with Brooke. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Catherine. I'm thrilled to be here today. I'm Brooke Thompson. I'm the Executive Vice President of Government Affairs at Associated Industries in Massachusetts. For those of you not familiar with AIM, um, I say to those um, that haven't heard of us, we're sort of the mega chamber. We're a statewide organization representing all businesses throughout the state from the Berkshires to Boston. And um, we at AIM have been very focused on this issue. Uh, much like the secretary said, this is not a women's issue, right? This is a human issue and it is certainly a business issue. Um, issues around uh, the impact of women in the workforce and what they've been dealing with have been facing women um, and thereby businesses as women being part of the workforce for a long time. And so um, at AIM, we've taken a special focus on this um, as a result of statistics we saw during the pandemic. And personally, um, I've been thrilled to be part of those efforts along with our board chair, um, Joanne Helferty from Goodwill Memorial <coughs> Industries. And um, as a working mother myself, find a, a personal interest in the topic. So can't wait to begin the discussion today. Great, and Parna, what about you? Hi, well, thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, I'm Parna um, and I'm the founder of Brandon Buzz Marketing. We work primarily with uh, tech companies and startups to uh, startups that are transforming, rebranding, are looking to raise funds. Um, my biggest passion and the privilege is also being able to work with women in tech and women entrepreneurs to help build and boost their digital brand. Um, I started my career in the tech world, my, my usual immigration story like every other uh, immigrant story, you know, come to this country with two suitcases, no support. Um, I started my career in the tech industry. And initially, I was extremely proud to be the only woman sitting around a table of very smart men. And then very quickly, I realized that that has to change. Therefore, I, you know, kind of got really deep into the whole 
uh, women in tech issues, how do we support more women. And since then, I also belong to several tech organizations. I've had the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, women in tech organizations, I serve on multiple boards, and have also had the privilege of meeting folks like Senator Jackson in California, who really pushed hard to get more women uh, on board, especially in the tech industries. Um, so personally, this, this whole topic is really near and dear to my heart. Plus, I have two kids, a boy and a girl, so I also have to make sure that we know that they're learning about gender inclusivity and supporting women. I am so thrilled to be here today. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And Liz, last but certainly not least. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Liz Hart. I'm the founder and executive director of Taylor for Success, which is a nonprofit organization based in Malden. So shout out to the Malden Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm really interested in this topic because the uh, bulk of the constituents that I serve are women and women of color. And so I have been dealing with um, the effects of COVID-19 on this population um, since it started, and especially women who were working in the service industry, food service, hospitality, and are experiencing difficulties due to the growing technological divide and family responsibilities. Um, most of my constituents are unemployed or underemployed. So this is an extremely important topic to me. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so in, in listening to Secretary Acosta's keynote, you know, uh, there, was, there was so much that stuck out to me, but the one of the big numbers of how that, that immediately jumped out was how Massachusetts lost 700,000 jobs at the height of the pandemic. 375,000 have been gained back, but there's still 325,000 left before we get to full employment. So just to set that stage, I think is really, really critical that, you know, it may feel as though when we see stories of, you know, folks getting vaccines and shots in arms, that it may feel like we're kind of crawling out of this. But I think there's, there's still a long way to go. But I, I think maybe if we can maybe take a step back. And and uh, Katie, I'm curious from your perspective, if you can maybe take us back to a year ago or for all of you to take us back to a year ago to say at this point a year ago when when the switch flipped so quickly from, you know, just kind of a normal everyday go about your business to uh, businesses have shut down. Most folks are staying home. There's a fear of contracting a potentially deadly virus every time you walk out your door. If, if you can maybe kind of take me back there to say kind of the immediate impact on businesses and on women in particular in the workforce when when kind of the, the immediate wave of COVID swept the East Coast. Um, sure. Well, it was it, it was a, across the board at first. A lot of people lost jobs, and obviously there was fear, and there was schools closing. Um, and then very quickly, it became clear that the people who were getting laid off um, were the people in the lower wage jobs. There were a lot of women, especially in uh, you know, as has been mentioned in uh, in uh, hospitality, hotels, restaurants, these public gathering places that could no longer employ women. And some of those women are still out of work. Whereas more white collar women, there, there certainly were layoffs and you know, loss of travel and gathering also affected them. But um, most of them, most of us got right back on our computers and could connect through technology and dealt with a lot of challenges with having children at home and, and that sort of thing, but were able to continue with work. Maybe it was longer, maybe it was more frustrating, but we're still making a living. Um, whereas a lot of the women on the lower end of the pay scale lost their jobs. And some of those jobs, uh, to your point earlier, are not, maybe not coming back. You know, there's some hotels that are still, you know, 25% occupancy and they're not hiring people back and they're firing workers and, and those jobs might not ever return. So there's a very unequal distribution of, of what's happening there. Sure. Um, what about for, for any of the other panelists? I'm, I'm curious, just kind of take me back to where you were a year ago. Sure. Sorry, Catherine. I'm happy to sort of jump in because we were looking um, statistically at, um, and we often survey businesses at AIM. Um, we have 3,300 members. So a lot of the time when we're trying to figure out what's going on, we put a survey into the field and try to get a sense of, um, you know, how they're dealing with things. And when the pandemic arose, we did put a survey out into the field to just sort of say, what's the impact, right? And it was across the board. 
Um, you know, are you seeing reduction in sales? How are some of the capacity restrictions impacting you? But what did pop up was, as, as Katie mentioned, you know, this impact, particularly on women and women of color, as it related, and time and time again, we saw it correlated with childcare, um, which is something the secretary spoke of uh, a little while ago. And the interesting thing is, as Katie alluded to, when we, when we looked at statistics from the spring, from like April and May, men and women were pretty much on par with having left the workforce. And um, you, you shift that to September and you get a giant jump um, where women actually jump up to 69%. Wow. Um, we're impacted. And we tried to say, what, why do we, now we see this huge spike? And based on the evidence we saw and the um, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, it was because that's when school started, right? Mm -hmm. And we had schools shut down. And so, again, as the secretary alluded to, because predominantly the burden of taking care of children falls on women, you saw a larger percentage of women either leave who hadn't had to leave um, or reduce their hours or change their schedules or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, we redid this survey just last month to try to say, okay, we're into phase four, right? That's supposed to be the people are getting vaccinated, there's treatments, where are we still? And we still saw that nearly 50% of our respondents said that women still are seeing a, a, an impact of having to reduce their hours, change their schedules or not return to the workplace as a result of childcare issues. So while I think we've made some progress um, and certainly we've seen several districts throughout the state, particularly at the elementary level come back, you're still seeing a, a disproportionate impact on women as it relates to COVID. Right, well, and, and I think one thing that, that Secretary Acosta said that really stuck out to me was how, you know, when her children were growing up that, you know, that type of the childcare issue was always branded a woman's problem. And, and just now it's sort of become more of, you know, a, a, a business problem. And, I, and I'm wondering, where along the line, either, either in the pandemic or, or not, that that you all have seen that transition? You know, Sarah, I'm, I'm particularly interested on on work human side to make, I mean, to make work more human. I mean, so like, you know, recognizing the humanity of all of us and, and, and families, but but also, you know, Liz, I know from, from your history as, you know, from the Mass Commission on the Status of Women, that that's been something that that commission has talked about a lot of, you know, the need of, you know, the desperate need to support, uh, the, you know, to support families so women can be full and active participants in in the workforce. And so I guess maybe let's start with Sarah. If, if you can maybe, uh, how have you sort of noticed either childcare or just kind of women, women's support in general being more of, of a business concern rather than just, you know, a woman's problem? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when when this all started, um, we didn't really know what to expect. Uh, I think everybody was under the impression that this is going to be a few weeks. Okay, we got to shut down. It'll be a few weeks, month tops, and then we're all going to be back together again. And that clearly, here we are, did not happen. Um, so very quickly, we had to pivot as a business even um, you know, working on the fly to even change our business model, offering our services to um, for free to healthcare workers for, you know, to be able to recognize we had a whole thank you healthcare campaign. Um, we had to be very agile in, in, in making that shift. <clears throat> but in addition to that, at the same time, then you had schools shutting down. Mm -hmm. And so then now we had this, this huge population of women who were faced with having to be balancing doing their, their work and then having their children at home um, and so we were able to send, um, we sent a survey out to all of our employees through um, one of our um, technology products called Mood Tracker to really gauge where people were at, because it was important for us to be asking those questions and to really be understanding where our humans were at in all of this. And so we sent a resiliency survey and found that many of our employees were, were really struggling. Um, and so we were able to put resources and move quickly to help support them through. Um, I think that one thing that was helpful in all of this, though, as hard as it has been, is that for the first time ever, we were all on the same playing field. Mm -hmm. Men, women, it did, you know, different ethnicities, it didn't matter. We were all in this together, working through these challenges 
at the same time, whether it's the CEO that has his family and kids walking in and out, or it's that we were all equal. Um, and I think that that created a sense of connection and, and allowed for better conversations, um, more, more um, open and compassionate conversations to be happening across the business around how, how we support our women and, and our families going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, at personally, as a working mom, this is the first time, and it's awful to say this and admit this, but it's the truth. This is the longest I've ever spent with my children. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even get me started on the maternity leave policies in, in, in this country, but you know, it, it, that's a um, whole other conversation. That is a whole <laughs> other conversation. Um, but, but for me, this was the first time in my life that I was actually able to do both. And I feel like do both. Well, I didn't have to choose between all of the travel I was doing or whether I needed to be there for my children or be there for my job. Um, it was, it was, a level playing field. And I have felt that this last year, I've been a better parent and been, you know, excelled in my job because I felt like I've had that balance of being able to do both well. And so I think that's going to be an expectation now for businesses to be, to be looking at and to support that flexibility because women are going to say, look, I've just did this for a year and I, and now I want to get my kids after school. And now I want to be able to be there for both things. And so companies are going to have to start looking at that and being very intentional when they're putting their return to work practices back in place. Absolutely. And there's a lot that in there that I want to, I, I definitely, I, I still, I want to focus on kind of that flexibility and hybrid model that seems to be buzzwords and, and, and uh, you know, the, definitely on, on the childcare element, but I, but I do, I do want to loop Liz in just on the Liz, with, with your experience, not just with, with Tailored for Success, but also with um, the work that you've done at, at the state level with the the um, commission, the status of the Commission of Women, I'm I'm curious, you know, the the disproportionate impact of this pandemic on women of color in particular, and and on you know essential workers who predominantly are you know lower wage workers workers of color, and and how you are seeing those communities now that we're in this sort of realm of, of, of you know, vaccines are out there, the rollout is happening. What are you seeing now in terms of how those communities are thinking about, you know, I've, I've, I've been you know, working my tail off for the past year. How do I maybe think about, is there even room for upscaling or, or, for, or for new training or, or for, um, you know, approaching kind of a return ship the way tailored for success would would work for? Yeah, I, I, thanks. That's a, a really good question. Um, I, I can take this from two different perspectives. One perspective is the, um, the low-income woman of color who has been, um, just as Secretary Costa mentioned, um, who is home collecting unemployment and now making more money than when she was in the workforce, right? And so what is what is the incentive for her to go back to work? And we've seen that too um, through the commission and the surveys and the public hearings that we have. Um, Low-income women are subject to what they call a cliff effect, right? So you make too much money and then you lose all your benefits, but you're, you're not in a job that's gonna be able to support the healthcare and, and all the other benefits that, that you get from being um, on unemployment. And then the other perspective is, I think that this is opening up such an opportunity for low-income women and women of color, because now I think that um, in general, businesses see how important women are mm -hmm. and that we are the backbone and um, all of the things that we have had to shoulder all of these years that we've all talked about, you know, in ad nauseum, but now it's it's coming to fruition. And so now men are understanding how difficult it is to try to work and, and have a family and have other responsibilities. And I think that this this could be a really good opportunity, you know, like she said, you know, a pandemic is an awful thing to waste, you know. So <laughs> I think we can really make some strides here, but we do have to, we have to do this together. And it's just unfortunate that in the society that women low-income women and women of color um, have been on the lower spectrum of being able to get the opportunities 
being able to get the jobs that could make a significant difference to them and their families. And mm -hmm. I think what's happening is, is that all of this has just pulled the Band-Aid off and, um, and exposed all of the inequities. Mm -hmm. It really has. I think, you know, the it uh, just laid bare so many of the issues that were very, you know, sort of, it, there wasn't really an effort to, to open them up, I guess, pre pandemic. And now, you know, it really is just kind of all out there for, for everybody to see it. And, and Parna, I want to loop you in, especially on, you know, the, now that we're at this point where a lot of these, you know, inequities are laid bare, but as Secretary Costin and Liz have said, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. What, what are some opportunities that you're seeing on the ground now as, you know, as an executive, as, as a business owner for, uh, for not just for, for you to grow, but for kind of women in the workforce in general to be able to grow? Yeah, no, I think that's that's a really great question. But um, I was really chuckling when uh, Secretary Costa talked about her five kids and you know how she was dealing with it. Um, so similarly, I would say you know we we were the sandwich generations, um, you know, taking care of two kids and then also my parents. And um, when I was expecting my second child, and I'll come back to your question in a second. Of course. Um, and. Um, I had I, I had to stay home like I needed bed rest for the last three months and I was like oh now what's going to happen you know so I was really grateful that the CEO of the company and my team they allowed me to work from home and that was something that was never done before you know and that was several years ago and they sent like fax machines and phones and all the stuff that we needed. So I had them all around my bed and I was, you know, I was able to work. Um, and that a fax was machine by your bed. I can't imagine that. The noise that must have made. <laughs> and so like 10 years ago when working from home was not an option, right? right. You, you, you are pregnant, you, you leave or take a break. Um, but that was such a good lesson for me to learn down the road is because the change has to come from the top. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're looking at changing the culture, if you're looking at supporting more DEI initiatives, the CEOs and the C-suites have to make that change. And if it wasn't for my CEO of that company, I probably would have had like, you know, a big gap. Um, in my resume. So I think one of the things that, you know, I'm seeing right now, and I hope more companies can do that, but currently I think it's more the bigger companies because they have the revenue, they have the support to do that, is um, they're putting like really strong initiatives in place right now to support more women, to support uh, or hire more women of color, even people of color. Um, and the second piece that you know that I have learned from my career and having led teams um, is that flexibility is so key. So I feel that you know COVID has taught us all, especially the managers of companies that you know who thought that you have to be in the office to be to be productive. I think COVID taught us all that no matter where you are, you can still be productive, you can get your job done, you can still create innovative products that are saving lives. So I think people have come to understand the importance of flexibility because we are getting the job done. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that more companies will be, uh, will have DEI initiatives, bring back, you know, support more women, um, bring them back to work, especially the 2 million women who've lost their jobs. That's like, can't even imagine we are kind of five steps backward now um, with where we are. And if companies can continue to be empathetic and flexible to their employees, I think we'll be in a good place. Right. You know, I think so that that the flexibility, uh, you know, a hybrid model is something that a lot of employers are are telling, at least me at the Business Journal and, and Katie, I'm, I'm betting you're hearing those those phrases as well. And and I'm curious both from, from Katie, Brooke and Sarah, I'm, I'm curious from all of your perspectives now that so not just, you know, we're hearing so much more about flexibility, about hybrid, like, but Brooke, I'm curious what 
the appetite is from your from employers kind of from from your from your base of of constituents to say you know now that we have kind of um so many of uh, white collar workers have been at home either on laptops maybe not with the fax machine by their bed but <laughs> have been working remotely uh you know is there kind of an, an appetite for that post pandemic and then sarah and katie i'm curious on, on your sides as well just kind of what what you're seeing and, and hearing on just in in kind of the the um business owner side of, of things well, it's a great question. And I will say um, in the most recent poll we did of members, 70% said they were still allowing uh, employees to telecommute or work remotely. So mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing right now is as we're moving into this phase where more of the population are getting vaccinated, we know our members are going through that process of, okay, what does return to the workplace mean? Mm -hmm. And we're very careful at AIM to say that it's return to the workplace, right? Because to call it return to work infers that for the last year, all of these people who have been working differently weren't working. Well, we were, right? right. And particularly if you're a parent, male or female, and you were juggling taking care of kids and working, you know you were working. So as employers are grappling with how to bring people back into a physical workspace, you're right, Catherine, this issue of how to be flexible um, has come up. And we know at AIM, we pulled our own employees and a, a majority of them said they like this uh, ability to have flexibilities and partially work from home, but also be in the office. I think what we've tried to do, as, as Parna said, it's so key to have it leadership from the top. So what we've been encouraging through our Women Mean Business Initiative is what policies, particularly HR policies, can an employer put in place that allow for that flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. That incorporate some of these things that we are hearing from members that people want, not just women, but men too. Because if we are gonna seriously say that we want a balanced equal playing field, right? We need to get men at the table as well, engaged in these conversations so that we're not just talking about childcare as a woman's issue, right? Or flexibility as a woman's issue, right. it's a business issue, it's everyone. So some of the things we've been encouraging are if, if you're looking at promotions or um, tenure or things like that, take a look at the people who've had to leave the workforce. Maybe they're women, maybe they're men to deal with childcare issues. How do you bridge that gap right in the resume? How do you take that into account? Do you, if you get more money and you can bring people back, do you look at the females that had to leave first? Um, it, it's little things like asking employees what they need in mm -hmm. order to juggle this. What does flexibility mean? Because I think what we've all shared here is it's different things to different people, depending on what sector you're in, depending on get, in what socioeconomic status you're in. So it can be different. Um, it's even as easy as, and maybe this is easy, but we've seen this culture of early meetings or late meetings. Maybe don't do your Zoom meetings first thing in the morning or right when kids get out of school to mm -hmm. accommodate for parents to try to juggle some of these things. Um, so that's really what we've been trying to put out there. What policies can you put in place for employees that allow flexibility, that make them happier, want to stay in the workplace and grow and expand, but are taking into account some of the things that have really been beneficial as a result of the pandemic? Absolutely. Sarah, I saw you nodding your head vigorously. So, and Liz, I know that the the bridging the gap uh, talk must must be music to your ears. But Sarah, I I want to hear from you especially, just a, a, kind of if you could take off of, of what Brooke was just saying about you know the what type of policies you can put in place to really make sure that you're supporting all of your workers and and, and not just having it be you know again just a woman's issue. Yep. Absolutely. And I was nodding my head vigorously because we've been talking about that notion of like, it's not return to, it's not return to work to your point, right? We have been working. Um, so yes, that focus on returning to the workplace is so important, but I also think that it's important to note that this is going to be, um, complicated mm -hmm. and it's going to look very different for, for different companies. I mean, you, you have to know, your people, you have to know what works. I mean, we're 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 talking about, you know, this this spans so many different industries and you know, there are so many different roles and organizations that it's unfortunately not going to be a one size fits all policy. I wish it were, it would make my life so much easier as we're all trying to grapple with this. Um, but I think that there needs to be that understanding that it's also going to be an iterative process. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something, you know, you might have to you try something and then realize like, oh, yep, that didn't work so well. And let's go back to the drawing board. 
Um, but for us personally at Work Human, we've been looking at it through the lens of um, obviously, first and foremost, the safety of our employees, um, making sure that when we do return um, and, and we are together, that we are, we are bringing people back in a safe and, and effective and efficient way. Um, we're thinking about employees' mental health as well and, and the, the impact that being home for a year and being on Zoom for a year, I know we'll talk about all that later, but, but there's been a real impact to mental health that this has had. Mm -hmm. And actually we did a, we did a study um, and 71% said that the pandemic has had an impact on their mental health. So mm -hmm. that's, a real, um, that's a real problem that we also are focused on trying to help our humans through. Um, and also, you know, looking at it through shifting priorities and in habits. Um, there is going to be lots of different expectations and lots of different um, scenarios and things that we're going to need to take into consideration as we think about bringing people back into the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, for us, we have really, our, our culture has been founded on that sense of human connection. I mean, it's what we do as a company. Um, so we did not rush to put out a policy. I know a lot of companies pushed up, pushed out policy saying everybody's working from home. We no longer need offices. And for us, it's been a much more, we've been more thoughtful and intentional and we haven't come out yet with an official policy because we are, it's really important to us to make sure that we get it right. Um, that we do what's best for our, our human connection, our collaboration, but also the, making sure that we have that flexibility for our employees as we return. Um, and we're looking at it through, through the three C's is what we've been saying, which is, which is basically through the lens of community, mm -hmm. which is about the ways people work together. So really being intentional and understanding those, those human connections and their sense of belonging. Um, and so particularly for our women, you know, setting up resource groups that have really been a huge factor in helping our women, um, through this pandemic. Um, and we had 42 babies born. So mm -hmm. like that, there's a lot of women that are gonna be, when we do return to whatever the new normal will look like for us, like we're mindful that, that, that there's a lot of new moms that are gonna be struggling with, you know, trying to balance that, you know, working and, and family life um, through connection, which is about working relationships and how employees interact with one another, um, what is that going to look like if we're, you know, having these hybrid schedules where you have people on Zoom and people in the office? And what is that human interaction and connection going to look like? Um, and we've had 55 new people, actually more than 55 at this point, that have joined the company. So that's a huge population of people that have never stepped foot in our office. And so how are we, how are we engrossing them in the culture and how are we bringing them along when they've never even been in the office before? Um, and finally, our culture. I mean, that's the most important thing for, for our company, I'm sure for yours as well. And, you know, it's really that combination between the community and the connection and how we define our work environments, um, shared values and missions. And, you know, we've always had a culture of flexibility at Work Human, but we never had a formal policy around it. So again, trying to make sure that, that we are um, having diversity of thought, different perspectives, we have an um, executive task force that's working on return to office. We also have a return to office team mm -hmm. um, made up of different individuals throughout the organization. And so we're really trying to have a holistic approach and, and get that diversity of thought and different experiences um, into the mix when, when trying to plan um, for officially returning. Right, right. I think there's so, there's so much interesting interesting thought there. And, and, and Katie, to bring you in, I'm, I'm curious when you just, it, it just in your coverage of, of sort of the workforce in general, what, what have been some themes that have been emerging as you've been talking with employers or talking with, with those in the workforce about what a new normal could look like, what a return to the physical workspace could look like. And, and, um, I know you've done a lot of, of research and focus on sort of the, the disproportionate impact of, of the pandemic on, on women of color on, or on people of color in general. And so I'm, I'm, I'm also curious when, when you're thinking about some of those themes emerging about a return to the physical workspace, 
how you can maybe see that impacting those different communities that maybe never left their physical workspace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, I do think that there has been, uh, as we've been talking about, a great awakening among employers about the needs of working parents, right? And they're focused on it in a way that they never have been, which benefits everybody. Um, I mean, there isn't a company that I've talked to that has said, we're coming back to office 100%, five days a week, nine to five. You know, nobody is, I mean, some might be doing that, but they're not going to admit it. I'm sure they're not going to call the BBJ or the Glove and say, hey. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, We're going back to the way things were, you know. I think every employer is going to allow their workers to, to, you know, be remote, if possible. Obviously, there are many that you have to be in person, but when there is that option that they will allow them, you know, even if it's just one or two days a week, they're going to allow that. Um, and that, you know that's such a boon for you, it, it, even if it's just not having to race from your office to your to the tea to your car to the daycare. You know, it's uh, as we all know, just getting back even thirty minutes on either end is huge. Um, uh, it does seem like people uh, companies are thinking about daycare subsidies um, or contracting with you know backup programs in case of emergencies. Some have even talked about putting daycares on site. I think a lot of more of them are are thinking about how important that is and. We saw what the safety net of schools and daycare, we absolutely need them to work. If we don't have them, we can't work. So I think employers are realizing they need to play a bigger role in providing that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there would be less um, less business travel. There would be more virtual meetings like we're having now. Um, and you know that's good for working, you know, giving time. It's all about giving time back, right? Um, hours will probably be more flexible. There will be you know, more acceptance of people, you know, finishing a project late at night or early in the morning so they can run off and get their kids. I think that was kind of hush hush before, you know, if you were, you know, calling in from driving your kid to a soccer game, you didn't admit it. And now everybody's like, oh yeah, we are all actually human, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think this peek into employees' lives has, has given companies this empathy for their workers that that maybe they didn't have to as great as extent as they do. And hopefully this will carry out across the board. Obviously, it's much harder if you have a job where you have to be in person. You know, you can't have that flexibility. You can't have that remoteness. And as employers there could, to, could do more with the child care piece. Mm-hmm. You know, they could be offering a lot more support in different ways than they are. And, and hopefully they're, they're thinking about all those things. Mm-hmm. So on, on the child care element, you know, I... Uh, earlier this, I I was going to say earlier this year, but I actually don't know if it was this year or last year. My uh, sense of time in the pandemic has just gone completely kind of wobbly. Uh, but I I uh, spoke with uh, Ellen Rothstein, uh, who's the the um, uh, VP of of HR at Boston Children's, and um and she on a panel said that they at Boston Children's kind of in the height of the pandemic had expanded their emergency childcare services and utilization of that program went up by 700%. And that number just, I mean, just blew my mind, but also, uh, you know, you think of uh, the, the, the workforce and the demands on the, you know, the labor pool of a Boston Children's Hospital in the pandemic and also, the resources that you know an organization and an institution that has you know tens of thousands of workers could could pull together to have even an emergency childcare service. But you're, but you're seeing now, you know, I think even just today or recently, you know, Canada's finance minister announced that they were putting in 30 billion Canadian dollars into childcare, um, you know, childcare support and for their Canadian infrastructure. And um, President Biden has. In, in, included 39 billion, just shy of $40 billion um, in, in the US in the infrastructure uh, plan for uh, US, uh, I guess for US childcare support. And and did it, well, I guess, I guess kind of not to be glib, but did it really need to take this long to kind of get to the point of, of you know, a global pandemic where, where you know, so many people have died and there have been so many stressors to to realize that you know it's not just a woman's issue to 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 need child care and and i guess the, again not again not to be glib about it but just like what took so long and and now that it is kind of you know the the opportunities there to say that the awareness is there that this is such a big issue how can we really kind of take hold of that opportunity and and make it something that is just included in 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 the workforce 
to come or just in kind of, you know, society to come, which is a big question. It could probably be a book, but go. <laughs> that's a really really interesting question that you asked you know what took so long mm -hmm. um but i often find that this conversation goes in waves you know you have this whole woman in tech as a big conversation then you talk about uh, diversity gender race what have you right that it just comes in in waves i feel now this is the biggest wave that we need to write on and people are away, companies are supporting, as you were saying, the government is supporting, and it's not just in the US alone, I mean, UK, they did the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. When the, um, the emergency workers had to go back to work, the teachers were brought in to take care of their, of the, of their children. Um, so in the tech world, for example, you know, for us inclusion, the, the data that we have been seeing that, and you know, if, if you're trying to drive innovation, the more inclusive your organization is, the better is your innovation. So I think the number was something around 170% um, better at innovation if you have a diverse team. Um, the way I look at it sometimes is that, and maybe this is because my husband has been so very supportive all through my career and we kind of, you know, he, I support him when he's crazy and then vice versa. Um, but, I wonder if it makes sense sometimes to have the male allies as part of this whole change that we are talking about. Yes, it has to come from the top, but also can we find male allies? How do we get sponsors to help us get through this process? And one of the things that I personally um, try and advocate as much as I can, especially to the men, is when, you, when your company gives you paternity leave, take it. Right because you're not doing us a favor by not taking that paternity leave because that way it kind of flattens the the resume for example if the guys can also say i took whatever two months three months you know a paternity leave then it doesn't become a taboo for women so it's their responsibility that when they get opportunities like that take it Mm -hmm. And um, recently, yesterday, I was watching this Bloomberg um, conversation that was happening where somebody said, oh, when men get paternity leave, they don't take it because they feel they're busy. The male anchor he chuckled and he goes, I know why, because they realize how much work it is to take mm -hmm. care of the kid. So <laughs> nobody wants to take the paternity leave, you know, so I thought that was really funny. But my point is, it, it'll be great, you know, to have more male allies support the cause so that you know it kind of flattens the the curve a little bit sure does anybody else have some thoughts there i saw everybody kind of nodding their heads liz i see you nodding pretty pretty strongly yeah i just i wanted to take a different perspective um i totally agree with everything that Perna has said and um with everyone has said but I don't want this point to be lost. Um, we've talked a lot about what the employers can do and what companies can do to support the flexibility and to help women. But I think that um, I'm a big proponent of, um, we now, like the secretary said, you know, women are at the forefront. Everybody's looking at us now, but we also have work to do, right? And so we also have to be able to pivot and to step out of our comfort zone and be willing to um, get different skills, be upskilled, mm -hmm. um, the reskilling, because the jobs may not look like they were before. So we have to be willing to also ride this wave and work within it so that our opportunities can increase. We can't think, okay, well, this is what I did before. And so this is what I want to go back to. That may not be there anymore. So it's going to take a little getting out of the comfort zone for, for women or, or for anyone at that point to take advantage of the opportunities that are being um, afforded to us now. So, you know, we, we still have work to do, unfortunately. I mean, we will still have a lot of, um, the burden of the childcare, but um, but we also have to be willing to pivot a little bit and um, and go after maybe the position that before involved a lot of travel that we were hesitant to go after before, but now we can probably go after it because business travel has been you know pretty much eliminated. So that's an opportunity for us. So I think we need to think also 
um, the, the people who are listening to this need to think about, you know, what, what can I do mm -hmm. to put us in a better position? Exactly. And Liz, I want to come back to you. But before I do that, I uh, we're coming up a little bit on time, but I, I wanted to put out the question to uh, those watching. If you have questions for our panelists, uh, please drop it in the, the Q&A box. We're going to do our best to to have uh, some time for a Q&A at the end of this. But uh, Liz, to to follow up on 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 the point you just made, which I think is really key, when when you know, we talk about up, you know upskilling a lot, but you have so much you know on the ground experience with women making that transition, sort of back from you know taking a break for for whatever reason, and and transitioning back into the workplace. So, can you talk us through a, a little bit of that work, but also what are you know some of the skills necessary to make to make a transition, and 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 now. Are you seeing it sort of in a post COVID world? Are you seeing skills? Are you seeing a different skill set be demanded now than maybe there was pre pandemic? Yeah. So I'll take actually the last part first. Um, I am seeing different skills where uh, before COVID, the skill set was focused on manual skills, you know, doing the job. How do you do the job? But now, um, post COVID, the skill set that is needed is more the soft skills, you know, the communication, the problem solving, but also the technology technology piece of it is going to be key. Mm -hmm. It really is. And and then again, back to my point of you know, you're going to have to go out of your comfort zone a little bit because you may have to learn new technology. Um, for example, um, I, I have an intern this spring where um, she was taught different skill sets because when she started her program it was pre-covid right mm -hmm. and so now she's coming into an internship and has to learn all kinds of new things like you know google docs and running zoom calls for me and things like that um but she's been great because she has embraced it all and has not been afraid to learn something something new um so i think that that's really going to be very, very important. No longer can you think about, okay, I can do this task, right, manually. Now I have to think about, okay, everything has pivoted to a virtual world, and what is what is the workforce going to be looking like at that point? Mm -hmm. So, Parna, you're used to a virtual world. I mean, having been remote for, you know, for a long time, so. Are there any strategies or, or, or policies that you've either put in place or that you have seen be successful sort of in, in this, you know, Zoom world where we're all kind of on, on boxes <laughs> on a screen and, you know, versus kind of a, an in-person interacting? Yeah, so um, I think this was, you know, being uh, in a virtual world is probably the the positive that's come out of all the negatives that we've seen, you know, in the COVID era, um, and in a variety of ways, I think. Yes, we we are not able to meet people. Um, you know, hopefully in a few months we can change that. Um, but the opportunity is galore right now because people can work remotely, which means there are no boundaries as to which company you can work for. Um, I think you can be picky you know, uh, as to which company you want to work for also, or the kind of manager you want to work for. Um, because if it's a company that is not um, flexible, like we were talking about, you don't have to work there. You can work for a company in California. So I feel like that's that that, that opportunities for what, what kind of jobs you want has definitely expanded. Um, from a company standpoint, especially for startups, this has been phenomenal because um, like last year, my company alone, we did over 50 uh, virtual events for our clients. And it really worked well because it was less money. Mm -hmm. They were able to connect with people all over the world, you know, and that means better business for them. Personally, for me, I would say that I love the virtual world because mm -hmm. um, Again, I've I've worked in global companies, so we've had to manage virtual teams. My company is totally virtual. My my teams all over. My clients are virtual. Um, but for me personally, is that you know we get to meet with and connect with people 
of, of all countries, genders, topics. And um, one of the events that I host, and everybody is welcome to it, it's called Wind Down with Witty. So Witty is the organization that I serve on the board of here in Boston, Women in Technology International. And the whole point is we cannot go to the bar. So we meet every Thursday at eight o'clock Eastern, bring your drink, we have a conversation, whatever you wanna talk about. And this is where people come from, Texas and California and India, depending on the time frame. So I feel that the opportunities both for, for personal growth, personal networking, and for your businesses is definitely, uh, the, there's so many opportunities right now. We just need to take advantage of them. Absolutely. And Brooke, yes, please jump in. I just wanted to, Parna is exactly right, but it's also what she said is something businesses need to be aware of, right? The, the, what has come is a realization that now the flexibility on the part of employees to make different decisions and have different options in some industries is greater than ever before. So to some extent, what we say is the barriers to be able to leave Massachusetts are even greater, right? As Parna said, you can be sitting here in your home in Massachusetts and still be working for an employer out of state with all of the virtual options. And so employers need to be very aware of that when they are taking a look at these policies to make sure that they have access to the right talent pool. And the reason this is front of mind for me right now is we are seeing huge numbers of our members having vacancies and they can't fill them with qualified candidates. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more drilling down that needs to happen about that. But I do think a large part of it is this ability to be flexible when employees are making decisions about where they want to work. Yeah. And Katie and Sarah, I'm curious. Yeah, Katie, please jump in because I'm, I'm sure you have a lot to say about that too. Well, um, it's just so interesting, this idea of being able to take a job anywhere, like all these opportunities are, are out there. But there's research that has shown that husbands are less willing to move for their wives' careers' sake. Mm -hmm. And so now that having to move is, is maybe not an obstacle, it, it, you know, it allows these women who might have been held back by these terrible husbands, whoever they are, um, <laughs> to take these jobs elsewhere and really open them up. And yes, yeah, so companies here are, you know, at greater risk of losing their employers, even while it opens it up for, for women. So in that case, it's a great advantage um, for women, especially to have this more opportunity to, to, to change your career. Absolutely. And Sarah, I'm, when we talk about, you know, the, the kind of the, the technology element, but I mean, I think one thing that's been really interesting in the pandemic is something you mentioned kind of early on. The sort of, again, the human element of you know when when you're on a Zoom call with your coworkers and you know you're in your bedroom, you're in your living room, your kids are running past, they see your pets, they see your house. It really brings brings uh, your your team down to maybe a more human level than than there was than it was before, at least just anecdotally and from my perspective. And I'm curious for, for work human in particular, how you are balancing sort of the, the research that you've done and on sort of the, you know, how women are treated in the workforce and, and with the practical implications of that research to organizations, you know, kind of in this, in this post pandemic world where it is, so virtual, but there is a still a real human element to yeah. to to everything. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think this last year has has brought a whole new meaning to the term "bring your whole self to work." <laughs> um, we have brought everything to work this last year, uh, and my team and I actually have a running joke that if we're trying to get headcount approved or budget approved from our CFO, that the key to doing that is to make sure that your kids are in the frame and in the video because he's a softy for that. So we tend to get things done more there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we certainly are fortunate enough to have um, lots of data points on, on that topic of um, whether it's around equality and connection and particularly around through the lens of recognition and so, you know, our, we have a very smart team of, of data analysts that, that look at, the, at the, in, the data that we have on our platform. And we've actually been able to find um, and look at it through the lens of, of um, whether or not men and women are having different experiences in the eyes of, of recognition even, right? Um, what does it look like for minorities um, in, in their lens of recognition. And I actually just want to pull up 
just quickly, um, some interesting facts that what we found out <clears throat> was that what social recognition can tell you about diversity and inclusion. So we looked at it through the lens of, you know, are one group receiving more recognition than the other? What do networks and connections look like throughout the company? And how do those connections impact outcomes that the business cares about? Um, and, and what we found was, particularly as it relates to women, that women have significantly larger networks in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, they're connected to much more people. To me, that, that's a no-brainer. That makes perfect sense. Um, they have more gender balanced networks as well, more cross functional networks, more cross departmental networks, more highly centralized positions. Um, and, but what's interesting is that we're still seeing some trends in the data that show a disparate effect of, of the experiences that they're having. For instance, um, recognition from men tends to be more task oriented mm -hmm. and recognition from women tends to be more relationship oriented mm -hmm. and and even the language that's used you know whether if you're talk, looking at a group of engineers um you know in technology where there tends to be less women um it's it's there's a difference in in the awards that are coming through and the language that's actually being used mm -hmm. um but in addition to that though we found that um holistically with one year on on a recognition program or, or being a part of being a part of a program um asian black and hispanic employee turnover drops 20 percent wow. and female turnover drops 17 percent wow. so it's important to be able to have that that connection made and that um you know it does make a difference and um and we're actually something that we just release, which we're using internally, which has been fascinating to see, is we're even drilling down into the language that people are using in the awards that they are set giving and receiving. Mm -hmm. So if I'm nominating someone for an award, there's, it's called the inclusion advisor. And what it does is it actually can call out different biases that I may have in my award message to men, to women, to mm -hmm. different um, ethnic groups. Um, and so it can tell me, hey, give me a pause. Are you sure that that's how you want to word this? Because here's how it can look. So it has been um, really helpful for us as we look at the equity across the board. Um, but I think for those that may not have technologies in place, I think intention is key. Right. You have to be intentional with when you're trying to move the needle with change in all of these areas and whatever you can do, be intentional about it. So whether or not you are you know, partnering with different organizations for talent, for instance, right? Like we find that it's really difficult to hire women in technology, women in sales roles. And so we've been very intentional about the organizations that we partner with from a recruiting perspective. Mm -hmm. um, similarly to even vendors that are on our platform. Are they, are we working with vendors that are women owned, minority owned, right? Like these, these are questions that are coming to us from clients as well in RFPs. I mean, people are really starting to be intentional about this. And that I think is really the way in which we're going to start to move the needle on this mm -hmm. is, is to really have intention in the change that we're trying to make. Absolutely. There's so, that's so, that's so interesting in so many ways. And, and uh, I want to say just first, thank you to, to all of our panelists. I, I have uh, one more question and then we can uh, kick it to the audience. But uh, the question I have for, for all of you to, to end this is what, what is one thing that has surprised you the most out of the past year, either with your workforce or just you know the the demands on on your time um, many of you are working moms to what what has been something that has surprised you the most coming out of the past year Parna let's start with you she's like oh I didn't know you were gonna call on me <laughs> that's fine um I think it's a pleasant surprise is the way I would put it uh, the pleasant surprise being that people are much more aware of the DEI initiatives. They're working really, really hard to uh, to make a difference. Like Sarah was saying, you know, you, we are being very intentional. Um, however, there's a lot of companies that are struggling to do it right. They don't understand that um, that your your DEI strategy or your uh, hiring more women or women of color is hard work. 
it has to be part of, it has to be integrated into your corporate strategy. It's not about, oh, I'm going to hire, you know, 150 women this year, check. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, oh, we, we are writing this whole blog series to talk, you know, to talk about women's issues or women in tech or what have you. It's, again, great intentions, but I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that more of these companies will take it to the next level so that they really understand how to make it work for them, which in turn will help more women get back into, uh, into the workforce. So for me, it's a pleasant surprise, not a bad surprise. We just need to help them get there. Absolutely. Brooke, what about you? Um, on a personal level, just how much more productive I've been able to be both with my children and with my employer as a result of uh, the flexibility. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've saved that time in commuting and it's allowed me more time to be with my kids um, in an environment none of us ever thought we would be with our kids, you know, being a teacher and a mom at the same time. But I will also say, you know, on the, on the uh, professional front, I've been surprised about how a lot of people still continue to view this as, well, when we get kids back to school, everything's going to go back to normal. We just have to open schools back up and all the women can come back to work and this will be okay. And I, I, you could look at that from a negative standpoint. I choose to turn it into a positive, which is we really have an opportunity to provide education around this. As I think Parna said, and the secretary, this is not a new issue. Mm -hmm. COVID has shined a spotlight on something that was a pre-existing condition, so to speak. And so we need to do our part through opportunities like this, today's session, and all the great work everyone's doing here to talk about how there are underlying things that have led us to this point, and we have a real opportunity to try to address them. So I'm optimistic. Sarah, what about you? Can we talk about how I don't think I'm ever going to be able to bowl again? I mean, like that's like a real thing. I mean, there are there is some real post-pandemic PTSD that I am certainly going to be dealing with when this is all said and done. There's so many um, things that we did pre-pandemic that it's like, do I used to do that? I know. I know. Um, but I think I touched on it earlier. For me, this has been a very um as hard as it has been, it has been a very rewarding year. Um, again, being with my kids. You know, my daughter's 12, my son is 10. And again, for, for most of their lives, I've been here, there and everywhere and trying to do the best I could to, to, to be good at both. And, and so that for me has been really, um, really important and, and has given me a different perspective on the way even in which I plan to work and want to work um, going forward. So yeah. hopefully it will open up those same opportunities for, for everyone here as well. Great. And Katie, what about you? Um, I would say that I'm most surprised at how big of a permanent impact this is going to have on the workplace for all the reasons we've been talking about, you know, not having to go to the office uh, and, and the company's also paying attention to, oh, it's also important that we do get together and do have interactions because that needs to be in place too for us to be innovative, to be happy, to have morale. So how do we balance those things? You know, the attention being paid to employees need for flexibility and childcare, like just the, just the light, as we keep saying, that's being shined on this and how it's, it's going to have a permanent impact in hopefully in a good way. And I, a year ago, we never would have imagined that it was good. The earth was going to shift so greatly in this way. And it's, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Right. And again, last, but certainly not least, Liz, what, what is one thing that surprised you the most out of this past year? Sure. So what has surprised me the most is um, personally um, my ability to network and form collaborations. And I think, you know, as Kay said, this is going to, this is, a lasting thing. And um, I have been surprised at the willingness of people to just collaborate with one another. And there's not this, um, the competition between women that we used to see all the time, um, women are helping each other. And it's really surprised me. And, and it's something that um, I, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by, um, to see this collaboration and, and the networking and before where I was a little bit, I'm an introvert by nature, um, but I've been forced to be an extrovert and I will reach out to anyone on LinkedIn without a hesitation now. I love it. And people are receptive. <laughs> they're, they're, just, they're just really great. They're really great. So that has been really a surprising and um, very welcome thing to me. Okay. 
All right. I, I the true journalist in me is going to take take this right up to deadline. So I've got I've got a question uh, in this Q&A box and uh, that I think is very interesting. And it's uh, um, from Robin Arnold. Um, when we have more women in the workforce, companies thrive and are more profitable, but oftentimes hiring managers hire people who look like them. So what? how have you, how have you been, I, for those who are either in a position to hire or uh, Brooke, the, for, your, for your constituents, how do you approach redefining what that kind of looks like to be more inclusive of women of different backgrounds? Um, I'll just go quickly. This is about really the importance, as others have said, of DE&I initiatives and making yeah. sure that you are stepping outside your comfort zone and including other people from other experiences. And I think also what we've seen that works there is bringing more people into that hiring decision-making process who come from different experiences and backgrounds to provide that perspective. So you're not getting sort of this cookie cutter approach. Right. Well, I want to say again, thank you so much to all of our panelists, Brooke, Sarah, Katie, Liz, Parna. It's been such a pleasure. I've so enjoyed this conversation. I'm Katherine Carlock. I've had such a great time today. Uh, and I thank you all for joining me and I'll kick it back over to Erin. Thank you all so much. This has just been an amazing conversation over the last two hours. And I, I know that everybody who attended really appreciated it. Thank you all for your time for your insights, for your generosity, for your support, as you've been saying, of other women. Um, that seems to be a recurring theme that we have to support each other. It's Competition is not going to get us all ahead um, and we're all gonna thrive better by supporting each other. So if that's what comes out of the pandemic, then I'll be happy with that. Um, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you all the attendees for being here. Um, we look forward to continuing these conversations in the future. Thanks. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. Fun, you guys. Bye.